Hi doctor, this is the third part of our series on acute coronary syndromes. We need to understand more on treatment, angioplasty, thrombolysis, antiplatelets, and anticoagulants. The previous two episodes were very comprehensive. We discussed history taking, physical examination, ECG patterns, and how to put troponin in the clinical context, especially in non-cardiac conditions. By this time, the diagnosis should have been clear, right? Yes, most likely the diagnosis would have been established by that time. But you need to keep in mind that there is a long list of differential diagnoses to acute coronary syndromes. It could be cardiac conditions like myocarditis, aortic stenosis, hypertensive emergencies, it could be pulmonary like pulmonary embolism, bronchitis, pneumonia, pneumothorax, it could be aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm, could be pancreatitis, cholecystitis, gastroesophageal reflux, could be musculoskeletal disorders, costochondritis, herpes zoster, could be anxiety disorder or anemia. Well, to help sort out the diagnosis among that long list, shouldn't we rely more on tests like CT scan or on echocardiography? You can sort out most of the differential diagnosis if you take a proper history, perform a thorough examination, read the ECG carefully, and put troponin values into context. As for CT scan and echo, let's take them one by one. Coronary CT scan is valuable for patients in the observed pathway, in whom the troponin and the ECG results remain non-conclusive. A normal coronary angiogram by CT scan rules out both obstructive and non-obstructive plaques, has a very high negative predictive value to exclude ACS, and is associated with excellent clinical outcomes. Coronary CT angiography can also be used to stratify low-risk non-ST elevation MI patients. Such patients, when they are found to have normal coronary arteries or non-obstructive coronary disease, may not require an invasive coronary angiography. Yes, that makes sense. But wouldn't a bedside echo in the emergency room always be recommended? In the phase of the emergency department, echo should not delay transferring the patient to the cath lab and should not delay admission except in three situations. When we are uncertain about the diagnosis, echo can help us by finding wall motion abnormalities or abnormal left ventricular function, or when we're suspecting an alternative diagnosis. For example, you find unequal pulse or you hear a murmur of aortic insufficiency, then echocardiography becomes essential. Or when we're suspecting pulmonary embolism, where echo can show right side dilatation, right ventricular dysfunction, and possible elevation of the pulmonary artery pressure. The third situation where echo should be done in the emergency is when the patient is in cardiogenic shock or shows hemodynamic instability. Echo here is essential to assess LV functions and RV functions to look for mechanical complications like ventricular septal rupture or acute severe mitral insufficiency. Got it. Now the patient has been in the emergency for some time, we diagnose the condition and we are ready to treat. What is the next step? In fact, care should start earlier when the patient is still in the ambulance. Let's spend a minute discussing the ideal ambulance service. Ambulances must be equipped with ECG recorders, defibrillators, and at least one person trained in advanced cardiac life support. The medical or paramedical personnel in the ambulance, once they suspect acute coronary syndrome, should be ideally able to do an ECG and classify the patient into persistent ST elevation or ST elevation equivalents or non-ST segment elevation. And based on that, you will alert the emergency department that a patient is on the way. The initial ECG guided classification of STEMI versus non-STEMI can also trigger decisions in the pre-hospital setting including the choice of the target hospital and the sequence of initial investigations and interventions. You mean the ambulance team should decide which hospital will the patient land in? Yes, when the ECG shows a STEMI, that portends a higher risk of immediate life-threatening complications like ventricular fibrillation. Then it's an indication for initiating an emergency reperfusion strategy and direct transfer to a center with 24-7 cath lab PCI capabilities. The same applies to patients who present with an ECG without ST segment elevation equivalents, but they have ongoing ischemic symptoms because they also face immediate risks, including ventricular arrhythmias. Ideally, when a working diagnosis of STEMI is made in the ambulance, immediate activation of the cath lab should be done before arrival of the patient to the hospital, and this will reduce treatment delays and mortality. I got it. 
Patients at high risk should be channeled to a center with 24-7 cath lab capability. Yes, moreover, patients with ST elevation MI should better bypass the emergency department, but that of course needs a proper hospital setup and is not always achievable. So the majority of STEMI patients will still land at first in the emergency department. Okay then, what should we give them in the emergency until they reach the ICU inpatient ward or cath lab? The essential measures, I mean. Should we give them all oxygen for pain relief? No, only for those with oxygen saturations less than 90%. Oxygen supplementation in patients who are not hypoxemic is not associated with clinical benefits and therefore is not recommended. We give oxygen only when the oxygen saturation is less than 90%. Okay, then what should we give them for pain relief? Nitrates play a big role here, either sublingual nitrates or nitroglycerin infusion, depending on the severity of the pain. Keeping in mind, that nitrates should not be given to patients with hypotension, marked bradycardia or tachycardia, RV infarction, or known severe aortic stenosis, or phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor intake like Viagra or Cialis within the previous 24 to 48 hours because it can precipitate profound hypotension. Got it. Then what would be plan B for pain relief if nitrates are not enough or are contraindicated? Intravenous opioids like morphine, 5 to 10 milligrams, should be considered for the relief of severe chest pain. Some trials even suggest that intravenous morphine may also reduce myocardial damage and microvascular damage. However, morphine may enhance nausea and vomiting. It can slow the gastrointestinal absorption of oral medications, which may theoretically delay the onset of action of oral antiplatelet agents, which are vital here. But current clinical data have not demonstrated any increase in the risk of adverse clinical outcomes as a result of an interaction between morphine and antiplatelet agents in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. That's good news. Any remaining role for beta blockers in the first hours of a CS management? A limited role, actually. Intravenous beta blockers, preferably metoprolol, can be considered at the time of presentation in patients with STEMI who are going for primary PCI, but they don't have signs of acute heart failure, their systolic blood pressure is more than 120 mercury, and who do not have other contraindications for beta blockers. Administration of IV beta blockers in patients with suspected non-ST innovation ACS has not been tested. Great! Now we have taken all the necessary measures in the emergency department and patients are ready for admission. The important question here is, who should go to the cath lab? Let's better answer, why do we need invasive angiography and revascularization? Okay then, why do we need invasive procedures? The dominant cause of acute coronary syndrome is the rupture or an erosion of an atherosclerotic plaque with thrombus formation. An invasive angiography followed by revascularization will tackle that root cause. Yes, by dissolving the thrombus and opening the narrowed lumen. Great. Then how soon should patients with acute coronary syndrome go for invasive angiography? Let's discuss STEMI first as it's easier. All patients with STEMI need to do angiography unless they have a terminal illness that precludes the benefit from any intervention. Angioplasty in STEMI saves lives and saves muscle. It's the strongest indication for coronary intervention in cardiology. Then it makes sense to do it immediately. Yes, as fast as we can. Time equals muscle. If the patient presents directly to a 24-7 capable PCI hospital, then angioplasty wire should cross the lesion ideally within 60 minutes. For patients presenting to a non-PCI center with STEMI, the door in to door out time, DIDO, defined as the duration between arrival of the patient to the non PCI hospital till the time of discharge of the patient in an ambulance on his way to the PCI center. That door in door out time should be less than 30 minutes to expedite reperfusion therapy. Add to that 60 minutes until the wire crosses, then the total time for those presenting to a non PCI hospital should be 90 minutes. If, for any reason, you foresee or you expect that PCI will be delayed beyond 120 minutes from the time of diagnosis, then give the patient a thrombolytic agent within 10 minutes. Fibrinolytic therapy initiation should not be delayed waiting for the results of troponin. Also, pre-hospital fibrinolysis has advantages compared to in-hospital fibrinolysis, particularly when administered in the first two hours after symptom onset. Okay, we'll give them the intravenous thrombolytic agent, and then what? They should all go for angiography. They should go immediately if we suspect failure of reperfusion. Even uncomplicated cases with apparently successful reperfusion should go for angiography between 2 and 24 hours because there is a high chance of reocclusion after thrombolytic therapy in the first 24 hours. I got that.
What about those STEMI patients who present late? Do they benefit from PCI? The benefit is clear within 12 hours of presentation. For those who present between 12 and 48 hours, there is still some evidence that an invasive approach is superior to the conservative approach. But for those who present after 48 hours and they are asymptomatic, there is no benefit from doing angioplasty in that situation and these patients should be managed as we treat patients with chronic total occlusions. It is clear now. STEMI goes to the cath lab or immediate thrombolysis, then still goes to the cath lab. Is it the same in non-STEMI? No, non-STEMI is different. It depends on the risk, and we have risk categories, very high risk and high risk. Let's start by the very high risk. The very high risk patients are those with hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, recurrent or ongoing chest pain refractory to medical treatment, acute heart failure presumed to be secondary to ongoing myocardial ischemia, life-threatening arrhythmias or cardiac arrest after presentation, mechanical complications, recurrent dynamic ECG changes suggestive of ischemia, particularly with intermittent T-segment elevation. These patients should be in the cath lab as soon as possible within two hours, and the invasive approach here should be life-saving. And what about the high risk? Patients with high risk are those who have a confirmed diagnosis of non-STEMI, who have troponin elevation, those with dynamic ST segment or T-wave changes, those with transient ST elevation, or those with a GRACE risk score more than one four. These patients should go for invasive angiography within 24 hours. The majority of these patients will usually end up having a coronary thrombus, a plaque rupture, erosion, severe lesions, or multivessel disease. A routine invasive approach may not reduce mortality, but it reduces the risk of recurrent ischemia, myocardial infarction in some cases, and it also shortens the hospital stay. And what about other patients who don't have any of these risky features? In those patients who do not have the very high risk features or the high risk features and they have a low index of suspicion for non-ST elevation ACS, a selective invasive approach after appropriate ischemia testing or detection of obstructive coronary disease by CT angiography is recommended. Okay, doctor. Now we know who should get the invasive service and when. And the aim is to target the root cause which is plaque rupture and thrombus formation. But we didn't discuss antiplatelets and antithrombotics. Shouldn't a CS patients get antiplatelets? Antiplatelet drugs play a key role in ACS. Most patients will have a coronary thrombus, occlusive or sub-occlusive. And also antiplatelets are essential once a coronary stent is implanted, otherwise the stent may thrombose. Aspirin is started with a loading dose as soon as possible, preferably in the emergency of course, followed by a maintenance treatment of 75 to 100 mg once daily. Is aspirin alone enough? No, aspirin alone is not enough. We need to add a second antiplatelet agent. That's why it's called dual antiplatelets, to combat the thrombotic coronary environment. The second oral antiplatelet is a P2Y12 platelet receptor blocker, and we have three of them, clopidogrel, ticagrelor, and presogrel. And which one is the best in acute coronary syndromes? Looking at the evidence, presogrel is preferred over ticagrelor, and both are better than clopidogrel. Presogrel and tecagrelor are more potent and induce a quicker platelet inhibitory action. And so, they are the preferred agents. Clopidogrel is the weakest among the three and has the slowest onset of action. So we use it if the other two agents are not available, contraindicated, or in patients above the age of 70 with high bleeding risk. Here we can still use clopidogrel. All three agents should be given in a loading dose, then in a maintenance dose. If most patients will go to the cath lab and get a stent within 90 minutes in STEMI, 2 hours in very high risk non-STEMI or 24 hours in high risk non-STEMI, then it makes sense to give the loading dose of ticagrelor, prasigrel, or clopidogrel in the emergency department or before angiography, right? That's what we used to think and that's what we used to do in the old days. Pre-treating old STEMI and non-STEMI with dual antiplatelets before the procedure to achieve platelet inhibition before deploying the stent. But now the evidence does not show that this pre-treatment makes a difference and it can even be dangerous. How come? You just mentioned that the stent may thrombose if the patient doesn't take the dual antiplatelet therapy. There are two time phases for early stent thrombosis. Acute stent thrombosis within the first 72 hours. Acute stent thrombosis usually occurs due to under-expansion of stents or malapposition of stents, which is mostly a technical issue, where subacute thrombosis within 28 days is multifactorial and dual antiplatelets are important in that phase. Now I'm confused. When should we load acute coronary syndrome patients with the second antiplatelet? 
in non-STEMI pre-treatment with a P2Y12 inhibitor before angiography is useless and harmful. If a patient turns out to have multivessel disease and needs an emergency bypass, surgery will be delayed or will be undertaken with a serious bleeding risk. Also, large trials not only demonstrated lack of benefit with respect to ischemic outcomes with pretreatment, but also showed a substantially higher bleeding risk. So, routine pretreatment with a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor is not recommended in non-ST elevation ACS in whom the coronary anatomy is not known and an early invasive approach is planned. Give the loading dose at the time of the PCI. The onset of action of Tecagrelor and Prasugrel is fast. Should we also avoid pretreatment in acute STEMI? In non-STEMI, pretreatment is class 3, while in STEMI it's class 2B, which means that we can pretreat, but the benefit is still doubtful. Honestly, in STEMI, I still prefer to preload and I use Ticagrelor because I don't have Prasugrel yet. Why don't we just rely on intravenous antiplatelets to feel safe, get immediate platelet inhibition with immediate reversal of effect on stopping? There is no strong evidence for an additional benefit with a routine use of glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors in ACS patients scheduled for coronary angiography. Their use should be considered only for bailout if there is evidence of noriflow or a thrombotic complication during PCI. Also, there is an intravenous P2Y12 inhibitor, Cangrelor, that can be given if you feel you need even faster platelet inhibition. It gets class 2B in the guidelines. Cangrelor may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis in P2Y12 receptor inhibitor naive ACS patients undergoing PCI, including patients for whom it may not be feasible to give oral drugs in the setting of emergency PCI, like cardiogenic shock patients or patients on a mechanical ventilator. Okay, I understand now why guidelines cannot replace the clinician's judgment and why we need to consider individual differences in addition to evidence from trials. But shouldn't we also give an anticoagulant in addition to antiplatelet? Yes, we usually need a form of heparin. We have unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and fondaparinox. We also have bivalirudin. And what is the best agent among them to be used in patients with acute coronary syndrome? They all have advantages and disadvantages, but the general concept is that we should not cross over between different anticoagulant therapies. And we should usually stop them immediately after PCI, except in the case that we have another indication for anticoagulation in LV thrombus, atrial fibrillation, venous thromboembolism, or a prosthetic valve. Great. Let's start by the situation of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction going for primary PCI. Unfractionated heparin here has been established as the standard of care in patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI. In these patients, anticoagulation should be given during the invasive procedure. Giving the heparin in the emergency before primary PCI is not supported by high quality evidence. Alternatives to unfractionated heparin that can be considered in patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI include enoxaparin and bivalirudin. For enoxaparin, there is some evidence that showed a reduction in the primary endpoint of death, MI, major bleeding with intravenous enoxaparin in comparison to unfractionated heparin in patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI. So we can use enoxaparin. As for bivalirudin, the evidence is mixed. Bivalirudin is recommended as an alternative to unfractionated heparin in patients who have a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. As for fondoparinox, it's not recommended in patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI because of the increased risk of developing a thrombus on the tip of the catheter that has been noted with fondoparinox. Okay, so to summarize, parenteral anticoagulation is recommended for patients with STEMI undergoing primary PCI and unfractionated heparin is the default choice of anticoagulant at present. Enoxaparin and bivalirudin should be considered as alternatives in these patients, but fondaparinox is not recommended. Exactly. Then, how about those patients with non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome who are planned for an invasive approach within 24 hours? In patients with non-ST elevation ACS, anticipated to undergo immediate or early within less than 24 hours invasive angiography, parenteral anticoagulation at the time of diagnosis is recommended. Unfractionated heparin has been historically the anticoagulant of choice. However, in a meta-analysis of trials comparing unfractionated heparin with enoxaparin, mortality and major bleeding were not different between both agents. Therefore, enoxaparin is an ideal alternative to unfractionated heparin in these patients, especially where monitoring of clotting times and APTT is complex. But you said that we should avoid switching from one agent to the other. Can we use enoxaparin for anticoagulation during PCI? 
Yes, switching is associated with increased bleeding risk. PCI may be performed without additional anticoagulation within four hours of intravenous enoxaparin or eight hours of subcutaneous enoxaparin. PCI four to eight hours after the intravenous dose or eight to 12 hours after the subcutaneous dose will require additional intravenous enoxaparin during the time of the procedure. We give it intravenous in a dose of 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. It will give a therapeutic level of anticoagulation within 10 minutes and it will ensure full potent therapeutic anti-factor 10A activity for another two hours, which should be sufficient for PCI. Okay, then intravenous enoxaparin should be considered as the anticoagulant for PCI in patients with acute coronary syndrome in whom subcutaneous enoxaparin was used while awaiting coronary angiography. Yes, that's right. We can use unfractionated heparin, but it's cumbersome and needs frequent testing of APTT and dose adjustment. That's why low molecular weight heparin has become the standard in most practices before PCI and during PCI. Then any role for fondaparinox? Yes, fondaparinox is recommended in preference to enoxaparin if angiography will be delayed beyond 24 hours. This is based on the favorable outcomes demonstrated with fondaparinox in comparison to enoxaparin in bleeding and thrombosis. But the problem is the guiding catheter thrombus formation was of concern with fondaparinox and therefore a full dose bolus of unfractionated heparin should be given if the patient proceeds to PCI and this is the only case where we could switch anticoagulants in ACS. Great. We elaborated on settings where PCI is the dominant strategy. What about the antiplatelets and anticoagulants with fibrinolytic therapy? The first dose of aspirin loading should be chewed or given IV and then a low dose maintenance should be given orally daily from the next day. Clopidogrel added to aspirin will reduce cardiovascular events and overall mortality in patients treated with fibrinolysis. And there's insufficient evidence to support or refute improved outcomes with ticagrelor or presogrel in patients who were treated with thrombolytics. There's also no evidence that administration of glycoprotein 2B3A receptor inhibitors will improve myocardial perfusion or outcomes in patients treated with fibrinolysis and it might increase the risk of bleeding. As for anticoagulants after thrombolysis, the clinical benefit favors enoxaparin over unfractionated heparin. Enoxaparin was associated with a reduction in, in the risk of death or reinfarction when compared with unfractionated heparin. Fondaparinox was superior to placebo or unfractionated heparin in patients who were given streptokinase. Streptokinase is a very old thrombolytic agent. Is it still widely available? Yes, streptokinase is still used in low-income countries. But in middle-income and high-income countries, the evidence has shifted towards fibrin-specific agents, tenecteplase and altiplase. Tenecteplase has a bigger advantage because it can be given as a diuretic shot, then the patient is shifted for PCI. We call it drip and ship. After the shot of tenecteplase, we give low-dose aspirin, clopidogrel, and intravenous enoxaparin followed by subcutaneous administration until the time of PCI. This is the most extensively studied antithrombotic regimen as part of the pharmacoinvasive strategy. Thank you, Dr. Hussein, for this comprehensive review. I invite our audience to post their questions and comments, hit the like button, subscribe, and share the content to spread the benefit. Looking forward for the coming final episode on acute coronary syndromes.